Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles, your favorite true crime podcast. I am Donnie, and joining me is a man who wants everyone to know that counting calories is a great way to combine super fun things like math and not eating. <laughs> it's Dale. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's way ahead. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> We got nothing to say I just don't see how people can count calories, man. With a calculator. But then you don't eat. Yeah, well you just you just count the ones you eat. Yeah. I guess you just get tired of counting, then you're you're not hungry anymore. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how that works. <laughs> you just eat eat what you want and just drink a beer, don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, beer's like liquid bread. That's right. Yeah. It's so all you, good, good stuff in there. There you combine in some super <laughs> cool stuff too. Yeah, and it it gives you a little number on the side of the can so you don't even have to Use her head or nothing. You no, just it, just does, it, it, it just does it for you, right? <laughs> yeah. Then after a few, you just don't care what you're. That's right. You're doing. What's going on, dude? You know, same old, same old. That's right, man. Same old, same old. Back in the crack house, Back doing in an the episode. Crack house, having a good day. We're well, having a very good day. It's a beautiful day outside, and yeah. we in here recording. It's fair time, brother. Fair time. Fair time. Fair time. Good, best part of the year. It is. Well, good. One of the anyway. Yeah. Good smells in the air and just. Yeah. Cool outside. Feels I know good. you're happy because it ain't smoking as hot. Yeah, I just don't like that daggum <laughs> sweltering, s- sticky weather. Skeeter infested fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you got any good shout outs, dude, or anybody you want to talk about before we well, get going? Check this out. Hey, I like hearing them clapping. Yeah, look at there. We have another Apple Podcast five star. Five star, five star. Review. This comes from our old buddy JT here in Shelby that we don't know, but he's our new buddy. And this says, awesome show, even local. Found you guys via a friend posting on Facebook. Now the wife and I listened to the podcast on the way to the, the way and back from the beach this past weekend. Well, very well done. Easy to listen to and easy, easy to listen and follow. I can't read. Keep up the great work. Joseph Terry Shelby, Shelby, North Carolina. Well, Joseph Terry, we sure appreciate that five star yes, rate sir. and review. Thank you, brother. We do appreciate that. Thanks so much. And I hope you help you pass your time on to drive down to the beach. Yeah, that's right. Makes time pass by quicker. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody wants to be like Joseph Terry and go to Apple Podcast, you can leave a rate and review. You can also leave a some kind of comment on Spotify. Yeah. Click sure that can. five star there. And Dale, you can also, if you really want to help us out, you can go over to the store page and get you something cool. It's getting cooler weather. They got some hoodies over there. That's right. Long sleeve tees. Yep. Good stuff, man. Help support the crack house and keep the lights on. We appreciate it. Or you can just drop us a dollar. We'll take that, too. Or if you just want to tell a friend. Yeah. With your telephone. Yeah. Or just. <laughs> or you can see it on Facebook, just yeah. like JT. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Share, share, and like. JT, Joseph Terry. Yeah. Yep. So when they said share and share alike, I meant share, share, and like. Yeah. Yeah. All right, dude. I want to give another shout out to a, a listener of ours. His name is Landon Lindsay. He uh, gave us a message and he. Uh, done some case suggestions but also he is serving our country he is in uh fort hood texas yeah stationed there in fort hood texas but he's actually local here but he's stationed out there and we want to thank him for his service and what he's helping do for our country yeah and i appreciate the the episode suggestion yeah and we'll look into it and see what we can find out dude yeah we've looked into it before it's just hard to find out much about that situation but we've we've put out a few feelers to see if anybody anybody Smarter than us knows something. Yeah. Anybody knows anything. Yeah. That's right. Somebody, a few folks that are more connected than us. Yeah, we're connected, but sometimes all our connections just don't make connection. <laughs> our dots don't make it around the circle. They don't, do they? <laughs> uh-uh. They just run in circles. That's it. Yeah. Well, that dude, we're going to get going on this episode because, man, we got one heck of a crazy case. You know, we always say that, but this one here is... Pretty much close to us. It's weird. Yeah. I'll it's give you that. one county over from us. Yeah. We're in Cleveland County, but this is coming to us from Gaston County. Gaston, baby. Yeah, so this will... Down in the gas house. This will uh, interest a lot of our local listeners, if they're not familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Didn't but, I didn't even know anything about it. No, it's a pretty interesting case. And yeah, it's been... It's not that old, really. No, it's been profiled quite a bit on several TV shows and different things, but we're going to cover it today. All right. But this is the case of... Jamie Michelle Fraley, but she went by Jamie. And it's not spelled like aces. No, it's not spelled like ace at all. all right. It's a F R A L E Y. Correct. And she is from Gaston County. She's born in Gaston County on March the 5th, 1986. And her mom is Kim Fraley. There's no information on her dad. I don't know if there's a dad in the picture or not, but her mom was her. 
Well, he's not in our picture, so. No, he's not listed on anything, so. Uh, Let's keep it, leave it that way. Exactly. Right. But, well, there's, uh, apparently, there's a reason. Yeah. Yeah. But her mom was her world, and it was vice versa. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. But when Jamie was born, Dale, the doctors didn't believe that she would live beyond the age of one. No. Mm-mm. Even when she was born, they had to give her CPR to help her. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, and even her mm-hmm. mom. Right out of the gate. Yeah, her mom had trouble giving birth to her. So both of them, their lives were in jeopardy there for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so from the get-go, Jamie was struggling, man. She even struggled to gain weight. And throughout her younger life, she battled some anxiety and was even diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder. Right. Yeah, for most of her life. And it also been reported that she had some kind of intellectual disability, too. So you mean like a learning disability? Uh, yeah, I would think I would say so, yeah. That's what's been reported. But with all these things going on, this prevented her from graduating high school or even getting a driver's license. Right. Yeah. And these setbacks limited her ability to be able to go out and socialize. And she was dependent on friends and family to take her places and go where she needed to go. Yeah. Appointments, et cetera. Yeah. Whatever. Doctor's appointments or anything. Yeah. Yeah. But she was turning 20 years old and she wanted to get out from her mama's house. Right. She wanted to be able to be on her own. A little independence, man. Yeah. Don't hurt anybody. Yeah. And I'm, from what we read... It seems that she was having some uh, government assistance to be able to live. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So in 2006, she moved into an apartment there in Gastonia. This was at 1850 Lowell Bethesda Road. Right. And when she moved in there, she became friends with the maintenance worker there and his girlfriend. And during that time, she met the maintenance worker's son. Yes. His name was... Ricky Simmons Jr. And his dad was Ricky Simmons Sr. So we'll refer to him as Sr. and Jr. when we were talking about him. But her and Ricky Jr., Dale, they hit it off pretty quick. They were described as being inseparable. Yeah. And even moved in together and became engaged. Quickly. Yes. Very much so. But Ricky Jr., he had a criminal record, Dale. He did. Yeah. And a history of drug abuse. And this concerned uh, Jamie's mom a little bit, don't you think? Oh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Very well known, I think. But Jamie was the type of person to see the good in people. Yeah, that's all she saw, usually. Yeah, really. But Ricky Jr., he was going to have to go back to prison. Mm -hmm. He was going to have to serve 15 months in prison for some larceny. And this was between January the 4th, two. 2007 and April the 29th, 2008. So when he went into prison to do his 15 month stint, you know, she became more close to Ricky Jr.'s dad and his girlfriend. Her name was Kim Springer. Yeah. So we'll refer to him as first and last name because we got a, a Kim Fraley, which is Jamie's mom. Yeah, two Kims and two Rickies. Yes. Yeah. So a little bit of confusing, but we'll try to. And almost two KISS members with a Simmons and a Fraley, but they're spelled different. Yeah. You don't be the only one to recognize that. Yeah. Can't yeah. help it. Just jumps out at me. Yeah. But see, during this time, Dale, when Ricky Jr. was in prison, Ricky Sr. and his girlfriend, Kim, they had a drug problem. Yes. And they did. But Jamie was, she was wanting to help people. Yeah. She had, uh, there at her church, she had got into a group that were helping people with uh, drug rehabilitation. Yeah, I think she actually went to that thing to learn more about it because she had a couple friends that she had lost over addiction problems. So yeah. she wanted to go go to that thing that the church was putting on just to have a better understanding of what was going on with these folks. And she felt like this was her calling. She did. That's what she wanted to do. Yeah. So while Ricky Jr. was doing his 15 months, she decided that she was going to go back to school. Mm-hmm. And she was going to work toward getting her GED. Right. So she went to Gaston College and enrolled and was trying to get her GED. Yeah. And eventually go into drug counseling. That's what she wanted to do. That was her goal. Yeah. Yeah. But keep in mind, you know, we talked about Jamie being uh, feisty and stuff. Dude, she was only four foot nine. Four foot eight, I thought. Well, four foot, between four four foot eight. She was four foot eight and a half. Yeah. (laughs) 
and about 90 pounds i think 90 to yeah. 100 pounds right so she was tiny but feisty right so just keep that in mind going through all this yeah. it's like a hershey kiss ain't it? yeah pretty much yeah but jamie's apartment was two doors down from ricky simmons senior right and another thing about before we get too deep you know she even managed a personal myspace page dedicated to looking for and helping missing persons yeah which is pretty wild yeah she was ahead of her time yeah definitely and then you know while she was writing to ricky every day and then doing that and still going to try to get her a ged along with trying to work on uh, becoming a counselor so she was keeping herself very busy yeah and she wrote to ricky jr every day while he was in prison mm-hmm. yeah she was and she even had ricky tattooed on her ankle on her ankle yeah yeah so she was committed to this guy. Yeah. They hit it off pretty quick. And yeah, and she was, she was always cheerleading for him, even though everybody was, you know, trying to say, well, you might not want to get involved with him because he's got a past and he's this. And she's like, well, no, you just don't know him. Mm-hmm. So she, kudos to her. Yeah. But, you know, like we said, Ricky Sr. and his girlfriend, Kim Springer, they had their own problems. They were addicts. And Ricky Sr. even had a criminal record. Mm, Yes, he did. Yeah, because in 1986, he was arrested on first-degree murder charge for strangling an ex-girlfriend. Her name was Donna Miller. Yeah, I think uh, this girl and him, had they would be seeing each other, and they were both living in a mobile home with her mother. And some kind of something happened, and uh, she was breaking it off with him, and uh, he didn't like that. No. He's kind of a... I don't know, like a possessive, possessive kind of guy, I think. I would say so, yeah. I don't know him, but, you know, just from what we researched. Anyway, he had went back over there to try to uh, mend things and see if they could get back together. And, Reconcile. And, and, there you go. And uh, Donna hadn't, didn't want no part of that. And so she just told him to get out. And when she told him to get out and just leave, he became infuriated. Yeah. And strangled her. Yes. And he was admitted to a mental hospital for threatening suicide yeah i think he actually from what i heard he actually took her toddler son and left yeah and went to his mother's house and then he done something i don't know if it was an od or it was something because they they didn't say what i heard but it was what i'm thinking it was but they found him unresponsive in his mother's driveway passed out yes and the mother heard the, the child crying. It's the only reason they knew anybody was out there. Exactly. And so they got that. And then I think he threatened once again after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. he was a uh, very mentally unstable, I think. Yeah. But but he must have been a good maintenance man. Yeah. He was he was allowed to be a maintenance man at a, at the apartment complex. Here, have all the keys. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna talk about that too. Right. Yeah. But he was eventually sentenced on a manslaughter charge. Well, he convinced them that it, he didn't mean to do it. They actually tried to revive her after he yeah. tried to strangle her. Said he strangled her just for like less than a minute, and then he realized what was happening, and he tried to revive her, but I ain't buying that. Yeah, they give him 20 years, but now get this. Mm. He was released in 1992 on parole for good behavior. So saying he did how many years? Yeah, six years. Six. Yeah. Pitiful. Yeah, for manslaughter. Yeah, and then he gets out, and he's still running around doing drugs and Petty theft. Petty theft and larcenies. And so he really learned his lesson there, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. But like we said, uh, Ricky Sr., he was working in maintenance mm-hmm. on this building in Jamie's apartment complex. You know, and they developed a friendship because, you know, she was dating his son. And she would often hang out at his apartment. And she even became reliant upon him to help her run errands and take her to appointments and do what she needed to do right i think uh kim and him he, she was relying on but it seemed like maybe it's more him i don't know yeah or maybe kim wasn't there as much or something maybe well i think she she actually had a real job so I mean, well i don't mean a real job a job that was not at the complex mm-hmm. so she was probably gone quite a bit yep but reportedly jamie was aware of rick senior's past but was reluctant to stay away from him she was trying to help him and he wouldn't hang out with him you know right be with him yeah even while ricky jr was in prison yeah but i think he had a little little more bad intentions than just being friends yeah and it was even thought that ricky senior was being flirtatious with jamie oh he definitely was i think her cousin haley said, said that she knew that he was a lot of the stuff he said to her and flirtatious comments and a little bit beyond that that he thought it was, you know, okay, and Jamie acted like it was, but she, 
Haley said that uh, she didn't think that it went well with her. She just just let it go, you know. Yeah. She heard it and didn't didn't say nothing about she it. She just let it bounce off of her. Right. Yeah. And Kim Springer, the girlfriend of Ricky Sr., she wasn't too happy with this. Yeah, she didn't like it either. No. Uh-uh. And she would often come home from work, and uh, Jamie would be in the apartment with Ricky Sr. Yes. And she was also trying to get off drugs. Yeah, she was trying to be more, try to get her, get her shit together is what I'm trying to say. And Ricky Sr., he just didn't seem to be wanting to come off drugs. No, he was. That was his thing. He was happy where he was. Yeah. For some reason. So Kim Springer ended up breaking off with uh, Ricky Sr. Yeah. Well, so I think first she moved out into separate apartments, but they were still seeing each other. And then I think eventually it just kind of deteriorated from there, and then they just kind of broke off of that after and that. Yeah. She eventually moved out of the apartment complex and in with some friends. Yeah. But now we're moving up to April the 8th of 2008. This is when uh, there was a health care provider that had drove Jamie to the hospital because Jamie woke up that morning with some intense stomach pain. Yeah, real bad. Yeah. And once there at the hospital, the doctors diagnosed Jamie as having stomach flu. Yeah. And just sent her home with some medication and, I guess, a prescription and told her to get some rest. Yep. Plenty of fluids. Get some rest. Yeah, that's what they told her. But Jamie's aunt was quoted as saying that she didn't believe Jamie was diagnosed correctly. Right. Jamie didn't believe she was diagnosed correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And the pain got worse. But she continued on her with her, with her day because she was actually dog-sitting for Kim Springer. Mm-hmm. This was the ex-girlfriend of her future father-in-law rick senior right and i guess she kept the dog pretty often from what had been reported yeah i think so yeah but she was dog sitting that day and kim springer came by to get the dog yep that afternoon when she got off work yeah and she knew she was really sick and then she seen the prescription slip laying there so she offered to uh take it and drop it off for her to drugstore and then uh get somebody to come pick it up for later yeah because keep in mind, Jamie couldn't drive anywhere. Right. If she went anywhere, she had to get a ride or go on foot. Now, on the evening of April the 8th, Jamie decided to return to the hospital because she wasn't getting any better. And this time, she called Ricky Sr. for a ride. Mm-hmm. Now, he dropped her off at the hospital, and she walked in alone. And he left. Yeah, he left. <laughs> and the hospital couldn't get to her. She couldn't be admitted or seen for at least three hours good gosh so she tried calling ricky senior back to get a ride back to her apartment uh, because she didn't want to hang around that long at the hospital Mm -hmm. and he didn't answer so she got a friend to pick her up and drop her off back at her apartment around midnight this was on april the 9th and there were several witnesses saw her in her apartment at this time Mm -hmm. and this is supposedly the last time she was seen alive. Yeah. Now, Jamie called her mom to report that she had chills and was vomiting. And her mom offered to pick her up. But Jamie declined because the next day she had an appointment to meet with the Social Security Administration. Because what she was going to do there, Jamie was trying to become more independent, Dale. Mm, yes. Yeah, she was wanting to become in charge of her finances and control her money. And, Run her own life, basically. Yeah, because the her health care provider and her social workers were taking care of everything for her, mm-hmm. taking care of her money and her expenses, I guess. And I guess, well, there is, she's in this relationship with Ricky, and when he gets out, they're planning on getting married, so she's probably trying to set herself up before he gets out to be fully independent, or as much as possible. I would say so, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. But like I said, Jamie declined her mom coming to get her because she had that appointment. Yeah, and in some some places we read that it was because her mom was so far away, and in some places it said she was only 15 minutes away. So there's kind of a discrepancy of how far she actually lived from her mother. So I don't know. That That's kind of a, a hitch, and I don't really know. Because we, first we saw that when she moved out, she was only like 15 minutes away from her mom, which makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. And then later we, we heard in other places or saw in other places that it wasn't over an hour away, which didn't make much sense to me. So well, I would I would say she was an hour away because she didn't want to go to her mom's because she wouldn't be able to go to that appointment. It would be too far away. If she'd only been 15 minutes away, then the 
health care provider could have come and got her and taken her to the Social Security Administration for an appointment. Right. We, we couldn't her mom take her either way, really? Unless her mom had to work. Well, I mean, if, well, she could still take her, technically. Yeah. But if she's that sick, she probably didn't need to be going anyway. But anyway, that's... I'm kind of getting here. sidetracked here, but I was just I was just saying it's kind of a sticking point for me because I would I would like to know exactly which one's right. Mm-hmm. Details, man. I know I like the details because if you add them all up together, you can come up with something pretty important. Yeah, it's like that uh, calculator was talking about before. Go ahead. But Jamie gave no indication that she was in distress other than just her stomach bug, and she told her mom that she was going to try to go back to the hospital. So in the morning of April the ninth. Jamie's health care provider, who was supposed to drive her to the Social Security office, arrived at her apartment and right. knocked on the door. Correct. But there was no answer. Nope. And she tried to call Jamie several times again, but no answer. Yeah, thinking probably she overslept or something. So. Yep. And the door was locked. And she just assumed Jamie wasn't home and left. For unknown reasons, she didn't report this to Jamie's mother until two days later. Right. Which, you know, I get that. I mean... Because you don't really know. I mean, somebody just missed an appointment. You're not going to call her mama right away. Yeah. You're just going to think you're not home and we'll, we'll pick it up later. Right. And when they, she hadn't heard from her two days later, then you go, eh, maybe something's up. Yeah, because Jamie and her mom, they talked pretty regular. Yeah, a lot. Almost yeah. every day, probably. Yeah, and this was two days later. The family was not immediately concerned because it was characteristic of Jamie to go a few days without checking in. But... They wanted to know what happened to her. Now, Jamie's mother, Kim Fraley, not hearing from her daughter, called the police on April the 11th after receiving a chilling phone call. And this was from that health care provider. And having tried to call Jamie herself, the police sent an officer to the apartment complex. They do a welfare check. Yes. Do that welfare check and... They got a key to the apartment from the apartment manager. And they went in, and nothing seemed to be out of ordinary to them. They just, you know, everything looked. Yeah, no, no signs of a struggle, no signs of forced entry, nothing crazy in there, nothing going on. So it was like, hmm, well, maybe not. Yeah, they, everything seemed normal. And they noted, you know, Jamie being bipolar and believed she may have just been out and about somewhere and just trying to collect herself. Right, and it's also said that she didn't really like taking her medication because it made her feel weird. She didn't feel like herself, so she didn't. She probably wasn't taking like she should. No, but just got to keep in mind up to this point, Jamie was doing pretty good, dude. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, she seemed to be on the right track and trying to get her life in order. Especially, it wasn't. She's doing far better than most folks. I'm telling you that. I mean, yeah, she's doing and it all. wasn't long till uh, Ricky Junior was going to be getting out of prison. Right, she was just tickled to death about that. Yes. Yeah. Now they noted that Jamie's bipolar disorder. And believe that she may have been out and about, like we said. And Kim, her mom, and Jamie's cousin, Haley Dennis, and her aunt, Stacy Dennis, they went to Jamie's apartment to look around for themselves. Right. Now, when they got to the apartment, they went in and they looked around, and Jamie's purse and keys were sitting there on the ottoman inside the apartment. Hmm. But her phone was missing. Yeah, her and the phone are not here. Yes. And they speculated that she wouldn't venture very far without her purse and her keys and that she just maybe stepped out to visit a neighbor or, and she'd be found pretty quick. And when they went in the bedroom, they noticed there was dried vomit there. Yeah. And this hmm. one, they got kind of alarmed. Yeah. Starting to go, hmm, well, cause she was a very cleanly. Yeah. And even at the top of the stairs in her apartment, they found Jamie's favorite pair of tennis shoes, uh, neatly sitting there, and the laces were missing. Right. And this is another thing. It's kind of a two-way information gimmick. Because uh, some resources say the shoes were at the top of stairs. Others say they were sitting by the door. Yeah. So I'm not sure which is which. But either either way, the laces were missing. Yes. And according to Haley Dennis, her cousin, she said that Jamie only ever wore these pair of shoes or flip-flops. Hmm. And she didn't wear her shoes without her laces. Yeah, and I don't think the laces were ever found. No, they weren't. I wonder if the flip-flops were gone. They hadn't heard. Hmm. Mm, I hadn't read that anywhere. But after going through the apartment, they they got scared. And the, the three women, they went out and they phoned the police. Yeah. And they waited in the parking lot as the police searched the apartment again. 
And while they were out there in the parking lot, they tried to call Jamie's cell phone. Mm -hmm. And they called several times and and got no answer. Now, eventually, they called. Yeah, one last time. Yeah, and a man picked the phone up on the other end. Yeah. A man answered. He answered, yeah. Now, can you imagine this? Jamie's mom was on the phone asking who this was, trying well, to find first out. First of all, you, somebody answers and you go, Whew. and then when they start talking, it's not her. Yeah. Can you imagine the thought going through your mind? Yeah. No. Who in the hell are you? Right. Yeah. First, you're, you're relieved because she's answering her phone and then it's like, oh, it's not her. And then you're like, who are you and why do you have her phone? But this man explained that he was an employee with the local cable company. And he had heard the phone ringing as he was out repairing some cable lines. Yeah. And he had found Jamie's phone in the road after a few minutes of trying to find the, where it was coming from, the ring it was coming from. Well, it was in the grass by the road. It wasn't in the road. Yeah. And the women informed the police, and they sent an officer to go get it. Oh, yeah. And it was located about three miles away, and it was at the intersection of East Hudson Boulevard and New Hope Road there in Gastonia. Mm-hmm. And the phone was scuffed up pretty good. And police believed it had been thrown out of a moving vehicle from the way it looked. Yeah, they didn't they didn't use a whole lot of smart here because they sure didn't protect it. No. Uh uh-uh. uh. And I mean I get the the cable guy picking it up and answering it. Oh yeah. There's no problem. But then it was also said that when the police went to pick it up, several of them handled it as well. Mm-hmm. And by then it's all too contaminated to use. Fingerprints all over it and everything. Yeah, you got fingerprints on top of fingerprints now. But Kim Fraley, Jamie's mom, said that she always had her phone with her. And it was this moment the police began to treat her disappearance as suspicious. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. And like we said, the police wanted to lift the fingerprints, but it was too contaminated. And over the next few days, they began searching the nearby woods and interviewing potential witnesses. And they even used canine units to trace her, but... No good. Didn't get nothing. Nope. And all the neighbors there in the apartment complex seemed to be cooperative... Until they interviewed Ricky Sr. Mm-hmm. And investigators, uh, they described him as cold and manipulative. And they felt Ricky Sr. raised a lot of red flags. You think? Yeah. Especially when they look at his background. Yeah. And he provided limited information. Of course, with his background, you think he wants to talk to the police? No. Uh uh-uh. uh. No. Mm-mm. So this is a bad deal. Now, they lifted phone records from Jamie's cell phone, and police discovered she'd made her last call at around 1.30 a.m. on April the 9th to a friend in Albemarle. This is about an hour away, or about an hour and a half away from Gastonia. Hmm. And she told this friend that she was going to go back to the hospital and stated, I have to go. My ride is here. He is here. That's all she told the friend. But no hospital record have anything of her being admitted or even coming in so she never showed up no but that's all she told the friend that now what she said what did she tell her again she told the friend on the phone that i have to go my ride is here he is here okay so where in the hell is everybody getting this thing about a truck well they said who's they well everything i've read and listened okay, to okay. that uh it was going to be a truck right but it's so I, that's, that's what I heard too, but according to this quote, she didn't say nothing about a truck. No, unless the quote's coming from somewhere else and she mentioned a truck somewhere else. Hmm. But. Told you. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crazy stuff with this story. But now Ricky Sr., he didn't drive a truck. He drove a white paneled van. Imagine a, that. A work truck. Creeps like, van. I guess he drove, done maintenance and now this truck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now some people are speculating that it's possible that Jamie referred to this white panel van as a truck. Well, I'll give you that. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, even like my wife had an Explorer one time and it'd always be like, where's mom's truck? You know, this kind of thing or whatever. But so, I mean, that that fits. But I just wondered, you know, where it comes up. I don't know. I just wondered where the truck comment came from. Yeah. I don't know either. Okay. There's a lot of things that are unknown about this case. Gotcha. We're just going to try to. We're doing our best. We are. And there was at some point later, police, they received a phone call about a bag of trash that was left on the side of the road. And this that, was where yeah. they'd been searching. That always kind of weirds you out on when you yeah. see a trash bag on the side you of the road. You ever see a, ba- a bag of trash on the side of the road and think it's about a, a body in it or something? Something. Well, not a body, maybe parts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. 
But they found this bag of trash on the side of the road, and it was um, about two and a half miles away from Jamie's apartment. And supposedly it was in an area not many people frequented. Hmm. And police connected the trash bag to Ricky Sr. Imagine that. After interviewing him again. It was his bag of trash. Yeah, they went through it, and it was his trash. And this, so we don't know what was in the bag. We haven't been. Nobody's told us what's been in the bag. No. But he happily admitted to have leave, left the bag there. Well, he said that uh, he had gotten a flat tire, and he had to throw the bag out to be able to get to a spare, and just didn't pick it up when he left. Yeah. Which, you know, it's possible, I guess. I guess if you got a spare tire, you're getting kind of frantic, and you want to get it done, and you let set the bag of trash out. But, you know, he was in a van. Yeah. How much room did he have in the van to be able to just put the bag of trash outside? He could just put it somewhere else in the van. Oh, yeah, that's possible. But well, yeah. if he was sitting right at the back, like if he had thrown it in the back and saying he was going to take it somewhere, then, you know, he'd put it there where it's easily accessible to throw away and not put it back up in the middle of the van. But also, if he was leaving a compartment complex, you'd think they had a dumpster there. You'd think. But anyway, it's his life. He can tell it any way he wants. Exactly. <laughs> But like I said, he said he set the bag of trash out and forgot to pick it up. Yeah. Well, you know, well, on the spur of the moment, that's pretty good. Yeah. I'll give him that. The location of the bag, the cell phone, and Jamie's apartment complex, they triangulated almost perfectly. Yeah. If you put the three dots on a map, it's almost a perfect triangle. Yeah. Which is crazy. Which, I don't know. I guess it's. Yeah. I don't, but, I don't know. I don't know what it means or what it don't mean. But now Jamie's mom and her family, they had a hard time believing or accepting that Ricky Sr. could be involved in her disappearance. Right. And at first, uh, Ricky Sr. seemed to be concerned for Jamie in a phone call with Kim Fraley. Mm -hmm. He almost stated that he believed that she'd been abducted and that whoever took her wasn't ready to give her back yet. Yeah, that's what he told her. Yeah, that was his quote. I bet her stomach just dropped when he said that. Wasn't ready to give her back yet. Wasn't ready to give her back. That's pretty specific. Very. Yeah. From a guy in a creepster van. Yeah. (laughs) That's been serving time in prison for murder. Yes. Now, law enforcement, they obtained a warrant to track Ricky Sr.'s movements. They put a tracker on his van in hope that it would lead in some clues and, I guess, follow him around, see where he would go. Right. And anywhere he went, they would go and search around there just in case something was going on. Yeah. Yeah. But instead of finding Jamie, they found that Ricky Sr.'s movements were more disturbing. Yeah. He was out here stalking his ex-girlfriend. Yeah, Kim Springer. Yeah. Weirdo. Just like the first one, you know. And the authorities, they contacted Kim Springer, and they warned her of Ricky Sr.'s behavior. Mm-hmm. And they told her he, they may need, well, she may need to get a restraining order. And she did. Yeah, on, April, on May the 9th, she got a restraining order. Mm-hmm. But this didn't seem to hinder him any at all. Ain't nothing but a piece of paper, boy. That's right. With his name on it, that's it. Mm-hmm. So on April the 29th, Ricky Jr., he was released from prison. Yeah, and he was not a happy feller. No, because while he was in prison, he had found out that Jamie had went missing. Yeah. I think he saw it on the news or something, right? Yeah, and he got so upset and irate, they had to put him in solitary confinement. Yeah, he's a little bit out of shape. Yeah. I'm sure he was going to do some harm. Yeah. That's his girl, man. Yeah. So when he got out of prison, Jamie's mom was even there to pick him up. Yeah, because he didn't have nobody else going to pick him no, up. No, his daddy wasn't going to pick him up. No. Mm-mm. Yeah, and they said that they didn't have the greatest relationship, you know, because he was, I guess, you know, doing jail time and stuff when he was younger. But when he was living with him, when he actually met Jamie, they said that was just kind of probably because he didn't really have nowhere else to go Yeah, at that time. So uh, Kim, Kim, her mom, Kim, Kim Fraley, you know, went to pick him up, and then he didn't have nowhere to go. So actually, he lived with her, with her and her uh, boyfriend for a while. Yep, and they conducted their own searches and everything. Mm-hmm. They were putting out flyers and hitting the roads trying to find out what happened to Jamie. Yeah, but the month of May that year was pretty uneventful, and Jamie's family hoped that she was still alive, but it wasn't looking too good, dude. Well, right at the end of May, there's some weird happened one day. Uh, Rick Sr. called Rick Jr. and wanted him to come meet him at a Lowe's uh, home, home home improvement store. That's right. And uh, 
He didn't want to go meet him because he didn't really want to talk to his dad. I think he had some suspicions that his dad might have been involved. Actually. Well, he told him that he had some information on Jamie. Well, yeah, once he told him that, then he went over there. Exactly. When he just called him, he wasn't going to go. And he said he he uh, had some information on where she was or where she was or where she may be. So he went to meet him right then. And when he got there, he didn't want to talk about that. He was just beating around the bush. He's beating around the bush. This and he was wanting. He thinks he was just. Somebody said he was wanting gas money, but if he's wanting money, I'm saying it probably wasn't for gas. No, not for his car anyway. So anyway, and so when he told him he actually he thought he might have been involved in wanting to ask him if he'd take a lie detector test, he just turned around and walked into Lowe's, mm-hmm. and that was the end of that. But yep. it's kind of weird that he would call him and use her name to to draw him out to try to get money off of him. Yep. Crazy. Yeah, very much so. So going back to Kim Springer, this was the ex-girlfriend of Rick Sr. Mm-hmm. She was at work one day, and she came in, and she there were some coworkers came in behind her and said her car alarm was going off. Yeah, she worked the second shift somewhere. Yes. Yeah. And she went back out to her car and didn't notice anything, didn't notice anything weird, just nope. the alarm going off. Yeah. So she turned the alarm off and went back in to work. Right. Yep. Correct the do. Now, on June the 7th, 2008, Kim Springer, the ex-girlfriend of Rick Sr., she noticed a, an odd smell in her car. Right. And I'm pretty sure this was the same day, but I'm not positive that it's the same day. Yeah. Because it's, the dates kind of get wishy-washy a little bit. But I'm pretty sure this is the same night that when she got off work at 1030 after the, the alarm incident in the parking lot. Yep. I think this was on a Friday because on Sunday, June the 9th, she was, um, uh, taking some friends to church. They were going to church that morning mm. and her and her friends were in her car and they noticed the smell yeah, even getting, more. Yeah. It's getting worse. Yeah. And, and she, she, she said that, uh, we saw an interview where she actually said she thought that it was, uh, maybe her old workout clothes or something. You know, yeah. She just couldn't really figure out what the hell was going on here. That's right. So they go to church and I guess that she takes them back home after church. And that evening, she was going to find out where the smell was coming from. Yeah, she from. was determined we're going to clean this car out and figure out what's going on. Yeah, and she was uh, cleaning out the front floorboard, and she had some books there that she was going to... Toss in the trunk. Yeah, get them out of the car and put them in the back. Mm-hmm, while she cleaned the rest of the car out. And when she opened the trunk, she couldn't believe what she was seeing. No, horrifying, I'm sure. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Rick Sr. was laying in the trunk. Decomposing. Yes. Yes. I mean, can you imagine this this sight, dude? No, and said you know what she said at first. She just couldn't believe her what she was seeing. She's like, "Whoa!" She's looking at him, and she kind of it scared her because she's like, "Well, he's trying to get me." And then she realized that he ain't getting nobody. He's, he's dead. He's dead. Yeah, and that was the smell. Yeah, that's what that's the smell they've been smelling. So she called the police, and the police they found several items of Kim Springer's that she had reported missing the weeks before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, somebody had. Uh, appeared to have broke into her apartment and got some things and even broke into her car one time and got some things. Well, she said she had put her uh, her purse in the trunk of the car, which is kind of weird to me that she said that she said that she'd put her, her purse in the trunk of her car. And then she said, but I must have forgot to lock it because I went back next time it was gone. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you forget to lose, lock your trunk? I don't know because you shut it, it locks. Yeah, unless she was saying maybe she didn't... Uh, Lock her car and it, you know, had a, maybe had a trunk latch in it. Could you know, have. Something like that, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. But, you know, they also, they found a knife and some other stuff, but he was known to carry pocket knives, so we don't really know if it was a pocket knife or if it was more like a bowie knife or something. So it was never, those details were never given out. Yeah, but they did find, uh, like I said, a knife and some other possessions of Kim's that she had reported missing. Right. They are in the trunk with him. Yeah. And several of uh, his friends had told authorities that he had actually told them that he was, that uh, Senior wanted to give Springer the surprise of her life. Yeah. And what that means, we don't know. And Kim was going to. Well, I'm sure he did. When she yeah, Kim that believes that he was going to kill her, jump out and kill her. Now, that part kind of bothers me, too. If he was going to kill her, why would he just go kill her? Why would you hide in the trunk? I don't know, because we're going to talk about that, too. This the autopsy report on him. Yeah, it just don't make sense to me. If he was gonna do that and surprise her, get in the back seat, maybe I don't know. It just how how are you gonna ambush somebody jumping out of a trunk? Even if even if you were hid in the trunk and they opened it and you're laying there sideways, I mean, how are you gonna jump out? I well, mean, they said he was in a fetal position laying there. Well, I know, but uh, he probably wasn't gonna be in a fetal position if he wasn't dead. 
he would just, but he'd still have a hard time jumping out of a damn trunk. To, yeah. I'm, wait, I'm gonna get, you. I'm gonna get you. It'd take me two days to get out of a trunk, <laughs> crawl out of a trunk of a car if I was in it. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. I got a knife. I'm gonna kill you. But give me a minute. <laughs> yeah. But before I got we, a cramp. Before we get into the autopsy report, I want to play a, a quick interview that Kim Springer gave. It's not very long, but she tells some details about exactly what she went through and what she in her own seen. words. Yeah. yeah, in her own words. I have no idea where she is. Um, as far as my relationship with Jamie, um, I love her. I hope that she's okay. I don't know. I'd like to think that he wasn't involved, but I really don't know. Um, and let me say that I was never afraid of Rick until after I left him, and then I became very afraid. Had some lunch, got ready for work went on to work. When I got there, um, a few of my girlfriends came in um, to my job and told me that my alarm was going off in my car. I went out to my car. I unlocked the car. I looked in the um, front seat and the back seat of the car. I didn't notice anything out of place. Went back into work, locked my car. When I came out that night, my car had a funny smell. Um, I thought it was my workout clothes. Um, came on home, went to bed, got up in the morning, went to church with some girlfriends in my car, smelt even worse, um, came home after church, did some things around the house, was going to go to a 12-step meeting that night, and I um, wanted to clean my car out to see if I could take care of the smell. I went to move some books from the floorboard to the front seat into the trunk, and when I opened up the trunk, I found Rick's body. Um, I didn't know at that point if he was alive or not. Um, and I just stood back and started screaming. I believe that he was waiting for me to be alone. And I was not alone. Yes, Rick and I became very close, first professionally, and um, after a year or so, uh, we formed a personal relationship. I knew that my guilt and shame were so extreme um, that I had difficulty facing my children and my husband, and I chose to leave. It was never my choice to leave my children, and I didn't pick up uh, my drug of choice until the first night I, after I had left my husband. But uh, what I'm learning is that um, I was born with the disease of addiction. I've been in, in recovery for um, two years, and so um, I have a lot to learn. I think, again, it's just a matter of uh, asking for um, forgiveness um, for my family and for any, any harm or embarrassment that I may, I may have caused, um, caused them. It was never my intention. All right, that's Kim's little interview there, and it's pretty revealing, dude. Yeah. What she had to say about Rick Sr. and what she saw in the trunk, man. I can't even imagine. Yeah, no doubt. Mm -mm. But the autopsy report of Rick Sr., it showed that he'd been dead in the trunk for two days. Okay, so this is two days. Now, he was actually found on June the 9th. Okay, so reported that she first noticed the smell on the 7th. And so now that's when we said it was possible that's the same day as the... Uh, the alarm. the alarm incident. Yes. But if, I don't know. So, well, so Haley had had to been in there before then. So, you know, what we were thinking is maybe the alarm was going off because he had opened the trunk with the alarm on and jumped in the trunk and shut it. Yeah. But if he's already, she's already smelling that same day, I would say it had to be before then, even though it was like 90 degrees on this day in June. Mm -hmm. I mean, it gets hot and humid here for sure. But yeah. how how quick would the smell start? I don't know this. I don't know. I'm not. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I, I, know I would think it would be more than two days. But I think I'm over, over, overreacting here. But I don't know. It's I don't just, know. You get a hot trunk. Ain't no telling. I just want to know. Okay, I, go ahead. I get it. Yeah. But now Rick Senior's autopsy report showed that he'd been dead for two days. That's what the report report said. Right. And he died from hyperthermia, which, which is, is a heat stroke. Yes. Okay. And also, he had alcohol and illegal substances were detected in his system. Yeah, cocaine is what I heard. Yes. 
and it hadn't been reported exactly how much um, of those substances right, yeah. he had in his body. Exactly. But the police speculated that Ricky Sr. was under the influence and decided to lock himself in the trunk of Kim Springer's right. car. And even though it did have an emergency latch and it was working, he didn't ever use it. Mm-mm. Some, it was a, they were saying that either he panicked or he was unable to find it because he was incapacitated by the drugs. But I don't know, man. This dude, he's a lifelong criminal. I mean, I'm, I mean, I ain't putting nothing on him. He ain't, I ain't bad mapping him. <laughs> but I just don't understand locking yourself in the trunk for anything. There's a, there's a, I mean, unless you're trying to hide and go over the border or something, why are you hiding in the trunk? It doesn't make sense to me. If you want to kill her, that'd be. He'd kill her. Easier ways to kill her without yeah. jumping out of a trunk. Yeah. I mean, he's already been following around for weeks. He could have done it any time. You had the theory of him being dead before he was in the trunk. Right. Especially if the smell was stirred up that quick. Yeah. But I don't know where she worked. And I do know she worked second shift, but it was early in the day, I think, when her alarm went off. So, I mean, unless somebody drove up in the middle of the day and put him in a trunk. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. that. That's just a kind of a weird theory. But I'm just thinking... To me, the, the smell and the timeline don't match up, but I wish I knew more about that. Because he did, when he broke into her apartment, he did have a copy of her car key. Yeah, and I think he was the one who stole her purse out of the, the locked trunk before. Yeah. So who's to say that somebody else didn't get those keys and put him in that trunk? I mean, that's true. But I mean, it, I don't know how big this fellow is, but it'd be probably take more than one of you if he's already dead. Well, yeah. I don't mean, maybe not, but I don't know. It's just weird. It's just a weird, the whole situation's weird. Not, mm. not as weird as finding them in the trunk. I'm sure she was. Uh, she probably still ain't got over that. No, I can't imagine, dude. No. Now, while Ricky Singer's unexpected death, you know, brought relief to Kim Springer, you know, his ex girlfriend, it was a devastating blow to the case, man. Yeah. Oh, sure, man. With no other persons of interest, or and most people accept that Ricky Singer was involved in Jamie Fraley's disappearance. Right, so if he did know anything, you're not going to find it out now. He took it to his grave. Yeah, took it to the trunk. Mm-hmm. But the police, they searched around the area. There's a report there was a pond across the road from the apartment building. They even dove that pond Yeah. looking for her and didn't find anything. They searched and they, they done nothing. It was just, everything's just nothing. It stalls out, like you said. But the... Theories on this, the first and the most popular theory is that Ricky Sr., perhaps, you know, on drugs and his failed relationship with Kim Springer and his obsession with Jamie, abducted and killed her and then dumped or scattered her body. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. And his violent past and his proximity to Jamie, you know, uh, it, it pointed in that direction. Yeah, and I think you actually had a... A theory for maybe they did something, or they hadn't gotten together, or whatever, and then maybe he knew that Junior was getting ready to get out of prison, and he was trying to cut that off before he found out about it. Yeah. And that's a good theory, too. Yeah, and Jamie was going to tell Ricky Junior. Right. That what, was, come clean to him, you know. Yeah, tell him everything, because yeah. I mean, she was engaged to yeah, his she son. Loved him, yeah, Now, you know, we don't know that anything did happen, but that's a theory. Mm-hmm. Very possible. Because he sure, if it was up to him, I'm sure it would have. And it might have did have anyway, and then maybe that's why the shoestrings were gone, and maybe he towed her out, you know? Yeah. And there's another theory is that Jamie, you know, like I said, she was off her bipolar meds at the time of her disappearance. And they, so many think that she just wandered away from home and got confused and started a new life or died of exposure. Or, or yeah, I don't believe you know that. Became a victim of somebody else along the way. She might come off her bipolar medicine, then it's not going to make her like she's got Alzheimer's or something. Yeah. But, but you know, what gets me, or, though, or dementia, I guess if, is what I'm trying to think. if Ricky Sr. really did kill her, why didn't he kill her on her first ride to the hospital? Yeah. Instead of waiting until 1.30 in the morning or whatever it was. Yeah. And if it was him, you know, why would she tell her friend she, her, her ride is on the way when he lived there? Yeah. He only lived two doors down. It's not like he had to get in the car and drive over two parking spots and pull up and drive. Exactly. I mean, he would just come over and knock on the door and say, let's go. Or, or I'm not going to take you. I'll meet you out, I'll meet you out in the parking lot. Yeah. One of the, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't have to wait for him to come pick her up. That's right. Yeah. I don't get that either. Yeah. I think this is one of those things where he is just so perfect of a, 
what am I looking for? Suspect. Yes. He is so perfect of a suspect that they did. They can't see nothing else. And I think it's going to come out, if it ever comes out, I think it's going to be somebody that was in, in the circle or maybe just right outside the little circle that did this. And, but he just, with his background, they just, you know, it's like almost his guy had to do it, you know, one of those deals. Yeah. But there's another thing too, you know, when her mom and her cousin and her cousin's mom went in, you know, they found her keys laying there, but the apartment was locked. Yes. So did she have to lock her? door with the key was it a push button lock was it a little turn knob to lock the door right and i hadn't heard of that but but you said you know you know people who lived in apartments that actually where you had to have your key to lock your door and i was like well that's weird and you go well you know that way you never lock your keys up and i'm like well i guess that's a good point but you know like a normal door you just either turn a little knob and shut the door and if you're going to use a key to lock the deadbolt you know you have to do that but Mm -hmm. you know there was a lot of big a big deal made about why her keys were in the house and the door was also locked so maybe it was like you said but like i would like to know if anybody lives in the apartments let me know (laughs) ricky senior you know like we said he was the maintenance worker at this apartment complex right so he would probably have access to copies of the keys but would he be he would i mean if he went to do do, well hell i don't know maybe he would just to make it look where nobody could just walk in but it's not like it's a crime scene i mean i guess it kind of is but it's not like he wasn't locking the door to keep people from going to see a bloody mess or something you know and holes in the walls and you know something like that Mm -hmm. because they said that you know it's kind of pristine in there because you know the way she kept her place and it's besides the vomit being on the floor and the shoes with no shoestrings and like I told you, maybe, you know, if she was vomiting, maybe she vomited on her shoe and took the strings out and washed her shoes and they were drying and maybe put the, you know, put the strings in. I don't know. They never found them, but you think they checked the laundry? I don't know. You would think so. Yeah. And then the apartment, you know, they realized that she was missing and she's not there. At what point did this become a a possible crime scene and they could start collecting some evidence there you know her dried vomit there could they not have tested that for something you would think so but i haven't heard anything about that and that's a damn good point because jamie she didn't think she had the stomach flu no she i think she was kind of thinking that somebody had poisoned her or something was going on because yeah like you said she didn't think that 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 diagnosis was correct and that's why she didn't ever go get the prescription filled when he first gave it to her and that's why kim s took it kim springer yeah yeah kim springer took it yeah but it was never picked up no it wasn't right so i just you know her being friends with ricky senior i just wonder if he maybe cooked for or prepared meals for and maybe tried to poison her you know and that wouldn't seem to be working she was just staying sick Mm. And he decided to get rid of her, and then he, and this Kim Springer, the ex girlfriend, maybe she knew something. They some people theorize that she knows more than she's saying. Hmm, could be. Yeah, I don't know. It's a lot of good theories. Yeah, I don't know about the vomit. You would think they they would have uh, at least tested that, and see what was in it. Yeah, any substance or anything, maybe what she had in her system. Yeah, I mean, as sick as she was, it almost sounds like she was like going through withdrawals or something but they said that she didn't do any drugs so that wouldn't be unless somebody was giving them to her and she didn't know it yeah that was her thing anyway it's a it's a lot of mystery to this and i'd love to know more in 2015 dale there was a possible confession on this as a man by the name of jerry case he was serving federal prison time for kidnapping and made a possible confession regarding jamie's disappearance and he had been incarcerated at the time. Right. And when he confessed, he was on trial for a 1985 murder in Gaston County, which he confessed in a 2012 letter to the Gaston Gazette. And in 2015, he wrote a letter to the another letter to the Gaston Gazette confessing to killing Jamie Fraley and another local woman who had been shot and killed in her house and then set the house on fire later that year. Prosecutors immediately dismissed his confession as unlikely regarding Jamie Fraley since he was incarcerated at the time. Right. So he's just trying to get credit. Sound like yeah, me. it sounds like, yeah. But Jamie's case is still unsolved to this day, dude. Don't know anything. Mm-mm. You know, I've reached out to our buddy, David James. He's uh, over in 
in that county. He's a uh, law enforcement, and he's been looking into some stuff for us. So yeah, maybe maybe, maybe we'll he, get an update on this. Maybe he can. That'd be great. So what are your thoughts on Jamie or disappearance, dude? dude? I don't know. It just like I said, it just it blows my mind. I don't I don't know what happened, and I don't know a lot of this that we do know doesn't make sense to me. Mm-mm. But the poison theory is makes a little more sense than you think. If he was trying to do that, and if he was trying to get rid of her, that'd be a good way to do it without looking like he did it. But yeah. I don't know where she is. Yeah, what did you do with the remains? Right. I wonder if he poisoned his damn self. Could have. Because he tried to commit suicide one other time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very, very possible. Him getting in the trunk is, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> We're going around in circles. We could talk about this all day. But in the aftermath of all this, Kim Fraley, Jamie's mom, kept a box of her daughter's belongings, including a poem Jamie wrote, and she shared... She suffered from depression in the months following Jamie's disappearance, for which she's got therapy. Mm-hmm. Jamie's case was also featured on a 2012 episode of or Investigation Discovery show called Disappeared. Mm-hmm. And the missing Jamie Fraley Facebook page was created to help raise awareness about the case. For some contact information, Jamie Fraley went missing from the Copperfield Apartment Complex in Gastonia, North Carolina on April 8, 2008. She was 22 years old at the time and possibly wearing a large white t-shirt and blue jeans. And at the time of her disappearance, she stood at four foot nine and weighed about 90 to 100 pounds. She has strawberry blonde hair and with blue eyes. And like we said before, she has the name Ricky tattooed on her right ankle. But she is currently classified as endangered missing with foul play suspected. And if alive today, Jamie would be 35 years old. Hmm. And we will put contact information in our show notes Mm -hmm. that people can call and contact on this case if anybody knows anything at all. Right. But that is the case of Jamie Michelle Fraley missing from uh, Gastonia, dude. If you guys know anything, give us a holler. I'd love to know more about this. Yeah, we will post pictures and information on our socials. Mm. yes all right dude we're gonna get out of here all right let's roll we want everyone to be safe please be careful and always be aware of your surroundings because the next episode could be about you this is the crack Crack house Chronicles. chronicles